Hello and welcome. So in the name of World Book Day this year, we are really excited to have the wonderful poet Paul Cookson joining us to answer a few questions and to read a poem from his poetry anthology, It Came from Outer Space and other poems. Um, and this book, I'm sure you'll know, is part of FFT's brilliant Roots to Reading programme for year two. So, hello, Paul. Good um, morning. <laughs> thank you so Happy much. World book day. Can I start by asking you um, to tell us a little bit about yourself? Any interesting facts that we should know about you? <laughs> uh, well, um, I'll, I've been a writer since, well, I've been a um, writer in school since 1989. So I was a teacher. And then I became a part-time teacher, started doing this. So this is my, my 34th year of, uh, of being a poet in schools. So in all that time, I've been visiting schools uh, as well as publishing. So I've got to the stage now where I go to a school and the teacher will say, oh, I'm glad you came in because you came into my last school. And I'll say, oh, where did you teach? He went, no, I was in year four. I'm now the deputy head. Oh, so wow. <laughs> so just bringing me on to my next question have you always loved writing poetry or is that something that's come a little bit later on in life no ever ever since uh primary school um i've loved writing i mean yeah i never liked maths i never liked the sciences uh, when i was secondary school woodwork was awful um i liked art i can draw cartoons a little bit and uh i like writing i'll tell you about my primary school i, I can actually read you the very first poem that i published really I was 10 years old one day i saw a windmill there in a field of tulips fair the tulips they belong to farms the windmills all have swinging arms in a field so bright and gay one windmill seemed to say how i wish the wind would stop my sails are spinning like a top the sails are spinning in the breeze the miller grinds a corn with ease sometimes fast and sometimes slow that's the way the windmills go the sails go merrily whirling round sometimes nearly touching the ground all of them belong to farms those windmills with their swinging arms thank you amazing so you were, you were 10 years old when you wrote that yeah yeah and I'm, i don't remember writing it i don't remember reading it out i think uh it, I that was amazing to come across that again later on yeah and i think i mean it, not only the fact that she's kept it the fact yeah. that when i read it out it does work because as you say you wrote the poems in an amazing book it came from outer space and other poems um, yeah. can you tell us where you got thank you can you tell us where you got your ideas for some of those poems well, a lot of the poems in here um, come from um, um, a visiting in schools yeah. because you, you find out what kids like, and you know, kids yeah. always like aliens, they like monsters, they like space, you know, those sort of things. But also, kids like joining in as well, and um, you know, particularly when I'm performing in a school assembly, I'll always start the day with a with, with an assembly for everybody, and that's forty five minutes to an hour, age four to eleven. And so I think, you know, I always think, it, I always call it, it's like pantomime with better rhymes. You know, the pantomime appeals to all ages. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, some of the humour you get, some you don't get, but you don't mind because it's never explained. Uh, and, it, you know, the, the bits that are rude and risque are never explained to the kids. They just move on in the sense, not this rude and risque. What I mean is those things that little ones don't understand, it doesn't matter because they're enjoying the, the participation and the joy of the situation. Yeah. So this poem has changed a little bit over the um, over the years since I wrote it into what it is now, the T Rex box. And when I'm doing it in a, in a school, I go everything stops when the T Rex and the kids go rocks. So you have to imagine the kids going rocks there's a dinosaur party down by the lake a rumble in the jungle starting to shake a tremble in the air like an earthquake but everything stops everything stops everything stops when the t-rex rocks there's a loud loud sound of heavy metal thunder dancing to the sound of a rock and roll number brontosaurus breaks into a rumba everything stops everything stops everything stops when the t-rex rocks when the t-rex rocks mountains crumble leaves all shake and treetops tumble boulders roll stones all rumble everything stops everything stops everything stops when the t-rex rocks there's a clickety click of his ten-ton claws the growl and the howl of his mighty jaws dinosaurs wild applause everything stops everything stops everything stops everything stops everything stops when the t-rex rocks and what you'll notice if you've got the book, it only says everything stops once. But when I started performing that, it just felt better to go everything stops, 
everything stops. Everything stops when the T Rex rocks. R rocks, yeah. Yeah. So you, you sort of adapt it a little bit as part of the yeah. performance. And I mean, yeah. you know, that, that wouldn't necessarily work on the page to say yeah. that. It wouldn't not work. I think what works on a page in, in this book works fine. But I think in performance, right. I sometimes have a version that you print oh, and a version really? that you perform. Right. That's because the two different the, the two different disciplines really yeah absolutely you have to and also with performance it. you've got context you know you've got yeah. context of, of participation or you've got context of humor some humor doesn't translate that well on the page yes because it looks it's just black and white whereas you know yeah. if, if it's halfway through a show then people you know the audience are with you they know the atmosphere and the spirit in which it's being said yeah, absolutely. If it's black and white, it didn't come over as a bit cold and, and, and oh, did did you mean that? Is that really funny? Well, yeah. it is performance, but it not, might not be on the page. So there's two different disciplines, really. Yeah, absolutely. I can see that. Um, so, you know, when you're, you're writing your poems, do you have a particular space? Is it the space that you're in now? Or yeah. can it yeah. be anywhere? Can it be just kind of when you're... Well, I mean, in? obviously, if I'm, um, you know, if I'm on tour in schools, um, yeah. you know, I, I might be in a hotel room. Yeah, th this is my office. Yes. Uh, so the desk I sit at, and yeah. these are books on the shelves and whatever. Uh, but I'll always carry a notebook round. Okay. So, notebook. Or I can show you this here. Uh, my brother in law made me this uh, for my birthday, and it says Paul Cooks and Poets at Work. Oh, lovely. I love a leather bound notebook. So sometimes I'll Beautiful. carry that. Yeah, so you can put a different notebook every time in there. Oh, brilliant. So I'll have a notebook, and um, a very rare, unless it's a hike, or sometimes I write a haiku straight at the computer, or occasionally on my phone, if, again, if I'm busy or something like that, but normally I like to write longhand first, right. and then type it up. Um, right. You feel the ideas flowing through the pen, as it were. Yeah, yeah, I'm very old school like that. I mean, I I, I suppose if you're just writing a story, I, I've ne never written, I've never written a, a kid's novel, but... A, I've written a bit of prose here and there, and I can do that straight on the, on the computer on the laptop. Yeah. But if it's a poem, I like to be able to see the words, and I'll, you know, I'll have a list of rhymes. Um, I'll just find you. Yeah, and you see there, there's a list of rhymes or colours or things. So you know, uh, I'm writing some animal poems at the moment, and I've I've just found some great animal facts like dolphins can be pink. Did you really? Know? Yeah. Wow. Dolphins can be pink, and uh, hip also hippo milk is pink as well. Really? So you have to do sometimes a bit of research into yeah, yeah. Um, well, Liz and myself are possibly going to do a little animal book together at some point. So I think, well, right. uh, my favourite animal fact ever is that, um, and I can show you a picture of this just to prove it, because kids often think it's hilarious, but is it true that wombats can do square poos? Oh, really? There's a picture of a wombat. Yeah. There's a picture. Oh my it's god. Perfect. That's yeah. the kind of fact that my children will absolutely love. Yeah. Tonight. Honestly. Oh, yeah. wow. And they use their bottoms to fend off predators. There oh, they are. really? And, and I was in the school two weeks ago, and I, I said, oh, some of you might know this fact about the wombats, and this little girl, she was like seven years old, either, but I, said, I think I know it, Paul. I said, what is it? Wombats use their bottoms to fend off predators. I said, no, I didn't know that. So we do, <laughs> they do now. And they bury themselves and have the bottoms out of the sand. Really? Yeah, and they can crush a predator's skull with the bottoms. I did not. I'm learning a lot about wombats here. That I and I'm not making any of this up. I mean, I'm obviously oh. there's, there's the uh, physicality of how does the head get to that particular area, which I don't want to go into. No, no, no. But wow. the idea that once it's there, the bottom can go smack like a nutcracker. You know, it's probably there's a snake. Definitely a poem in that, isn't there? I mean, oh, there's well, a whole book in it. Maybe a pocket yeah, book. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So we've talked about your favourite writers, actually. So you talked about John Cooper, Cooper Clark, and Roger McGough, didn't you? Is there the nice thing to... is that I, I now know these people. That, that, you oh know, that, wow! Yeah, As part I'm, of your career, you've. you've in fact, to... here when when I was sixty, oops. oh, there's a picture of John Cooper Clark there, actually. Oh yes, little yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah iconic. But, uh, when I was sixty, my wife wrote to John, and he sent me a handwritten poem. Wow! That isn't um, That's that isn't amazing. He wrote it especially for me. Wow, uh, that's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Living real inspirations to you. Is there anyone else that's kind of inspired you or other writers or when you were young or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, lots of people. I mean, like I mentioned Slade. I mean, I, I've, yeah. I've met three of Slade, Noddy Older, Jim Lee and, and Don Powell. In fact, Don Powell, the drummer, uh, has become a friend of, her, of mine. I mean, we make Les write songs and we're in a band with him. 
So if somebody told me when I was a kid, I'd be in a band with Don Powell out of Slade. Yeah. And I write the I don't sing, I just write the words. Les sings and Don drums. But we've done we've done three albums. And uh, you know, so uh, and and Noddy Holder I've met a few times. Um, but I'm lucky that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not famous, but I'm on the, I'm I'm on the circuit where I've met lots of people yeah, who have, have inspired me. To me, really yeah. So the, there's poets and writers, or, or occasional footballers, or whatever that you think. Well, they were part of my growing up. Yeah. So whether they inspired me directly to do something, or whether they were just part of the fabric of what I was going through at the time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I've been very lucky that I've uh, I've I've been able to meet and and work with quite a lot of people that. Yeah, uh, it's an amazing opportunity. You know, to meet it. Yeah. Um, so this is just our last question, and then I'll just ask you to uh, read a couple more poems, if you don't mind. That would be yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So uh, of the poems that you've written, which would you say, this might be a bit hard, actually, which would you say is your favourite poem of the ones that you've written? I'll, I'll give you two answers. I'll give you my favourite uh, newer poem, okay. which is from this book. OK. Um, and I'll give you my, and then I'll read my favourite poem that I wrote many, many years ago. I'll tell you still behind that. Uh, this poem uh, is called Friends Forever, and uh, Liz and myself did a book for another publisher called the Cro There's a Crocodile in the House. Yeah, and she illustrated that, and it's one of the poems in. It was originally in there as well, and um, the the poem uh, the Crocodile in the House is is a repetitive poem where I go big sharp teeth, and they repeat it big sharp teeth, open mouth, open mouth. There's a crocodile in the house. There's a so it's a it's a very distinctive way of performing a poem. And I didn't write this one as a, as that sort of, sort of performance poem. But one day I read it out straight after the crocodile one and the children joined in with each line. Wow, OK. Actually, it does work. So it became a performance poem by accident, really. And again, what I, mean, I won't do it now, but what I, what, I will, what I do when I perform it in schools is the kids will repeat each line after me. Mm -hmm. I always say to them, uh, I'm not going to tell you what the title is because when you get to the end, you'll guess it. But anyway, <laughs> if you laugh... I laugh too. If you cry, I'll cry with you. If you are sad, I'll hold your hand. I will try to understand. I will listen if you talk. I will follow when you walk. If you dance, we'll dance together. We can be friends forever. And they all join in with that bit. So oh, it's... beautiful! Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, that's my favourite serious one. Yeah, from there. Yeah, I know. And this is a lovely book, and Liz has done a great. It's a fantastic book. Yes, and yeah. beautiful illustrations by Liz Million, as you say. Yeah, absolutely, it's amazing. Um, so would you mind reading a couple of other poems from? Yeah, I'll I'll do one the, of your um, favourites, right? Okay, I'll, I'll do the Let No One Silly Dreams poem. Oh um, yes, okay. I'm just what going... I like about this poem is that I mean it's one of my favourites. I wrote it a long, long time ago. And when you write a poem, you never know what sort of life it's going to have. And uh, it seems to have become the year six leavers poem in lots of schools. Oh. Uh, it's been anthologised lots and lots of times. And um, it just seems to have, have had a life of its own. But uh, you, you don't know what's going to happen when you write that poem, you know, where, where, the, where those words are going to go. Sometimes, you know, they connect, sometimes they don't connect. That's the nature of writing. But uh, this one, you know, like I say, lots of schools have adopted it as the Year Six Leavers poem, as, as a school motto. It's been on library walls or whatever. And uh, it just seems to have connected with people. And it's about having dreams and ambitions. And I mentioned that I was lucky enough to to work with John Cooper Clark, or I've met John Cooper Clark and Roger McGough. Um, I mentioned uh, Slade. You know, somebody had told me when I, when I was 13 that I'd be working with members of Slade and writing mm. some. I believe that. Um, my favourite football team have always been Everton. I'm from the northwest, and uh, you know when I wanted when I was at school, I didn't want to be a poet. I wanted to be a footballer. Couldn't be a footballer, obviously. But uh, anyway, five or six years ago, Everton Football Club got in contact with me and asked me to write a poem for their season ticket campaign, which I did. I said, if you go online, or if you go on my website, Paul Cooks and Poet, mm -hmm. or go online on YouTube, look up Everton Home Poem, you'll find a video. Now it's not my voice on the video because they wanted a. Um, a local voice from Liverpool, a Scouse voice doing the poem. But uh, I wrote this poem about home matches and going to matches. And the first time I saw the film of it was at Goodison Park. And they played it before a match on the big screen. And at the end of it, like 40,000 people applauded. And I thought, wow, that's 40,000 people applauding my poem. Yeah. So even though I couldn't be a footballer or a rock star, 
you know, the fact that I've worked with my favourite football team, worked with my favourite band, you know, it shows you that dreams can come true in a sort of way. And that's a story I'll tell before I read this poem. Anyway, let no one steal your dreams. Let no one tear apart the burning of ambition that fires the drive inside your heart. Let no one steal your dreams. Let no one tell you that you can't. Let no one hold you back. Let no one tell you that you won't. Set your sights and keep them fixed. Set your sights on high. Let no one steal your dreams. The only limit is the sky. Let no one steal your dreams. Follow your heart and follow your soul. For only when you follow them, you feel truly home. Set your sights and keep them fixed. Set your sights on high. Let no one steal your dreams. The only limit is the sky. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. That's absolutely yeah. you can see why that's caught people's hearts actually in, in the yeah. it's a gorgeous poem. Thank you. Thank you. It, and it's I think I think Mallory Blackman said uh, she was put online, uh, the writer, she said, uh, which poem would you most like to have heard as a youngster? And she said Paul Cook was letting us Really, Mallory Blackman yeah. said that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, so just to finish off, would you mind reading one more poem from It Came From Outer Space? That would be okay. fantastic. Yeah, no problem at all. I shall read it. I'll read the title. It came from outer space. Normally when I do this, actually, what I do is I get the kids to go, uh, the chorus goes, this is it, this is it, it came from outer space. Uh, but I get them to put alien voice on <laughs> which is quite fun. I won't do that all the time, but anyway. <laughs> this is it, this is it, it came from outer space. Body of a slimy snail, flippers like a killer whale. Like a kraken, it's attacking with the spiky scale. Tail. This is it, this is it, it came from outer space. And they'll repeat it like that. Flies a million miles per hour, fiery like a meteor shower, strong and long like King Kong, marvel at its mighty power. This is it, this is it, it came from outer space. Turning, burning, churning eyes, growling, howling, yowling cries, hit a thriller like Godzilla, eating planets by surprise. This is it, this is it, it came from outer space. Colours that you've never seen, it's part reptile, part machine, supersonic and bionic, massive monsters moving mean. This is it, this is it, it came from outer space. This is it, this is it. it it came from outer space. This is it. This is it. It came from outer space. Beep, beep, whoosh. Beep, beep, whoosh. Silver saucer shining bright, flashing beams and laser lights. Beep, beep, whoosh. Beep, beep, whoosh. Faster than the speed of sound. See it spinning round and round. Beep, beep, whoosh. Beep, beep, whoosh. Breaking laws of gravity with maximum velocity. Beep, beep, whoosh. Beep, beep, whoosh. Like a diamond in the sky, beaming down from white on high. Beep, beep, whoosh. Beep, beep, whoosh. Nasty pilot, nasty crew, beaming down from me and you. Beep, beep, whoosh. This is it. This is it. It came from outer space. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to listen to that. That's absolutely Thank you. fantastic. What was it about those, those two poems? They started off as separate poems, but actually they just fitted well together. And again, that's oh, something that comes through performing. So you, you go from one to the, and you can see where the kids are going to join with the beep, beep, wash, and the, this yeah. is it. But then you come back to the, the chorus of the first one at the end of the second one. So, you know, that wasn't written like that. That just happened because of performance, you know. Wow, so it came so about... That, yeah, my, my advice when children are writing is, you know, yeah, firstly, read as much as you can yeah. because then you get an inspiration from lots of other people. Write as much as you can, but always read it out loud because then you know whether it feels right. And once you start reading it out loud, you get the rhythm and the cadence, the feel of the words, and start repeating phrases and then start experimenting with how it feels. And often when I'm working with kids in schools when I'm doing workshops... You will get ideas, and somebody will say something, and we we'll say, "Oh, that sounds good." Just say that again. And we haven't written it; we've said it. You know, it's, it's the feel of the words. Anyway, that's a different oh, word. That's we'll wonderful. Do another one like that sometime. Yeah. yeah, that's some great advice there as well for, <laughs> for budding writers. <laughs> that lots of competition on your hands now. Yeah, um, yeah. That's all right. I'm getting so old. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, Paul. Absolute pleasure, and Happy you. World Book Day, everyone! I remember. Yes, Happy There's World Book fantastic Day. Books out there, and this is one of them. Yeah, and thank you very much. Thank you. So we are very happy to have the wonderful author and illustrator Liz Millian joining us now to answer a few questions and to present a drawing tutorial for us. So uh, just a heads up, if you do have a pen and pencil handy, 
for a little bit later and something to draw on as well that would be really handy for you really great so do just pause and go and get that if you need to so it's all very exciting i am very excited about this <laughs> um, just a little bit of background so liz you may or may not know illustrated uh, or drew the beautiful pictures in the poetry anthology that's the one <laughs> it came from outer space and other poems which you may or may not know is part of FFT's Roots to Reading program for year two. So it includes many incredible <laughs> characters such as T-Rex, which will appear later. Yes, definitely. Um, <laughs> the Dinner Lady Dragon Queen and Robot Teacher, among others. Um, and Liz is kindly going to show us how to draw the T-Rex. Um, so without further ado, Liz, a very warm welcome and thank you <laughs> so much for your time today. Thank start you. Start by asking you a few questions if that's all right with Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Yeah, great. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> so, can I start just by asking you, just in general, to tell us a little bit about yourself, any interesting facts that you feel that we should know? About? Well, I'll tell you a bit about myself because yeah. I think I have quite an interesting job. So, you're probably sitting there in your school thinking, oh, she looks nice and colourful. Um, so I am quite a colourful person, but I surround myself with bright colours too, because it really makes your brain bubbly and happy. Did you know that? I have got the best job in the world because I draw books. I also write books as well. So when I'm not in my studio here, Zooming or uh, drawing in my studio, I am in schools uh, delivering workshops that show kids how to draw. Because I think sometimes when you are little, you don't think you're very good at drawing. Whereas I like to show you an easy starting point and then drawing from it. Now I'm gonna show you how I used to draw when I was little. Now don't laugh. These are some pictures that my mum and dad kept when I was little and you can see that's my proper name Elizabeth no one wow. ever calls me that unless I'm in trouble and I used to draw caterpillars and things off the tv oh, that's very and I then started to get quite good at drawing when I was probably about seven or eight and people started yeah. to say things like wow how have you drawn that and I'd be like what because I just thought everybody could draw uh, at school I wasn't very good at maths and telling the time and numbers and I used to sit and cry so I tell kids now that your brain can't be good at everything. So my talent at school was creative writing. I love drama. I always love making people laugh, but I love drawing. And it got to the point where I wanted to do drawing all the time. And I loved rainy days. And when I was at school, we used to read these books here. And these were written by a little girl called Jane Fisher. And I remember being little saying to my mom and dad that I wanted to draw in books like this girl when I got older. And that's actually what happened. So I went to school, uh, I went to university and college for seven years, and I've been an illustrator now for 26 years. And when I tell kids that they go, how old are you? Oh and I say, I am nearly 48. So I'm going to be 48 next month. And kids go, <gasps> like, you're so old. But I come with years and years of practice and going wrong and um, getting my characters right. I love drawing to the point where I feel like I need to go and tell kids how to draw as well. So that's how it all started. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so... As we said earlier, you created those wonderful illustrations. Yeah, yeah. Um, came from outer space and other poems. It came and from outer space. Yourself. Yeah, that's a lot. That's right. And the funny thing is, when you get asked to do a book, what happens is you get the words. So I've worked with Paul, Paul oh, lots yeah. and lots, Paul Cookson, who wrote the fantastic poems. Yeah. And when I read his poems or you know any story as an illustrator my imagination goes and it picks up on like adjectives and clues about the characters and maybe th think of a different angle that the poet hasn't actually thought about so um when i got asked to do it came from outer space i had to think of my biggest meanest alien that was going to go on the front cover and you can see his head was actually drawn with a potato shape and it said like a kraken he's attacking so i made him a little bit fish like with the kraken and he had um fins and 
uh, Flipper's like a killer whale. He was part robot as well, which makes him look quite cyborgy. And he was eating planets as well. And the other aliens, which I love drawing, were these little weirdos here. And they were not very nice. That was from Beep Beep Whoosh. So I love drawing. I always draw with a pen. Well, I start with pencil, then a pen, and then I've started to colour with marker pens, and then I'll finish it all off on the iPad. So that's a new way of working. So I used to do lots of painting, and it's very, very time consuming. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, when I work on the iPad, I could just delete stuff, muck about with things, take one thing, put a different background on, and it just saves me so much time. But I wow, still do. You, you embrace technology. technology yeah, you definitely. You've got to learn. And you're learning all the time yeah wow and where do you create your illustrations have you got well, a place or is it anywhere this is, yeah this is my studio um i could do my job anywhere um so i've tried to draw on the train before but people are very nosy and the <laughs> desks are very wobbly and sometimes with paul called paul cooks and i we did a crocodile book together and i was drawing crocodiles and i was so into it i was drawing like this and this lady was like what are you drawing and i was like oh and it's the people are very interested but they were quite nosy and they were my early sketches so they were rubbish and she was like mm. and i was like these are just me getting all my ideas down so i always start with loads of brainstorming and storyboards and working out how many pictures i'm going to need to tell my story uh, and when i do that i need you know a bit of concentration i've got two big desks here i've got my mac computer i've got all my pens i've got loads of weird stuff here as well i'll probably show you some weird stuff i've got a Actors. I've obviously got never far from my little T-Rex here um, and uh, yeah I just need space and light and music and it's just such a happy place I love it and I love Sounds it when fine. it's a rainy day so when it's in March springtime I love it because mm. it's a bit rainy it's nearly my birthday it's obviously world book week as well so I just love the spring season coming in now it's just a little bit more light in my studio but it's a mm. total tip at the moment because I've got a book on the go and when I've got a book I'm like yeah <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Same before, that your background versus my background. Mm. Yeah, but behind mm. here, though, it's a different story, guys. I'm not showing you. <laughs> There's just pens everywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. We can just see the perfect. That's Magic, all we need to say. That's all we need to say. Uh, so, finally, what sorts of things do you really love to draw? Oh, how long have you got? Now, I do get asked to draw really hard things and things I don't like drawing. So I've been asked to draw books with horses. It was a real challenge. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love horses, but have you ever tried to draw a horse? It's awful. So I never, ever say, oh, I think it's going to be a bit hard. If I haven't drawn something before, I give myself a bit of patience and I have a sketch. So I'll get loads of scrappy bits of paper. I don't work in fancy sketchbooks because if you work in a fancy sketchbook, you tighten up and you worry about going wrong and your mistakes mm. are there for everyone to see in that beautiful sketchbook. Mm -hmm. So my advice, I draw loads of bits of paper, like big A3 bits of paper, sketch, get sketch. Then I choose the best sketches. Then I go over it in pen and then I color it in. And that's what I do on every project. So I'll start really rubbish, get better, and I give myself time. So when I meet kids that say, I can't draw, I'll say, no, you have to tell your brain, you can't draw that yet. And that yet buys you a bit of time. So if you ask me to draw um, a tiger playing electric guitar, I'd be like, uh, okay, but it's gonna take me a while to get right. People think just cause I draw really big on my board, I get it right straight away. Now I'm gonna draw you one of my favorite things to draw, especially when I'm working with Paul Cookson. We draw all sorts with this particular shape. Now this particular shape, is called my seagull or my M shape. And you can see it's actually an archway. Okay, now there are a variety of different things we can draw with this M shape. I'm gonna get my new piece of paper. Now I love drawing dinosaurs and we never really know what color they are. So I think instead of just doing a brown one, we could do all sorts of colors. Can you see all those dinosaurs there? All different beautiful colors. So if you're drawing along at home or at school and you wanted to put color on, there's no reason you can't do a yellow dinosaur or a bright blue one. Okay, now I have got a giant pencil here and people always say to me, why have you got a giant pencil? First of all, when I work with Paul Cookson, sometimes he's quite naughty and I have to give him a poke to tell him off. But also I do a bit of sketching. So when I sketch, I do it really lightly. Now you're there thinking, 
I can't see it. Now the thing is, when I do my sketching, I don't want anyone to see it. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you with my crayons what I've just drawn really lightly. So the M shape starts off like that. Okay, so draw a very gentle M shape on a piece of paper. Now you want to draw it that sort of size at the top. Okay, so we don't need to have horns. It's not the dragon dinner lady. We're just going to draw it like this. And that's how she started as well. It's also a really good start for um, all different brontosauruses, hippos, even gulls and emus and things. Now, I've got a pen here, whoop, chucking my pen around. And I'm going to do two eyes. Now, you'll be pleased to know we're not going to be drawing the guitar one today because that is a little bit tricky to get his little hands right for you. So I'm going to do a dinosaur looking down like that this is also a starting point for a crocodile as well and a snake and a frog <laughs> it's a really good m shape now our t-rex if you look at my t-rex he's got his little eyes like that and he's got quite a long face it's all about the teeth okay so we're gonna come down and round you can make it as long as you like now t-rexes in real life you know, millions of years ago, they had massive heads. If you've all seen, you know, films with them, they've got big heads and little tiny hands, which is what we're going to go for. Now, it's going to be a bit tricky. We're going to do a smiley mouth. Don't go up to there because we're going to draw his jawbone around here. Now, if you've gone wrong, don't worry. You can go back, pause the video, rub it out, or you can try again. Remember, I draw 20 to 30 characters in pencil before I get the right one. I've been drawing this character for a long time. Now we're gonna draw nostrils, and these are the holes in your face, okay? People go, what's a nostril? It's where your finger goes looking for bogey treasure. Eh, yes, I know you boys. Now, we're gonna go up and down, up and down. If you want a nice one, you're going to give him nice eyebrows, okay? So I've done a book about nice dinosaurs, it's very cute. If you want a nice one, you can put eyelashes on as well, if you like. Hello, darling. <laughs> so see how that's changed. If you want a naughty one, this is where I get my big pen, looks like a microphone. And if you've seen it, it's very big and very wide. Bam, bam, bam. Now, that looks terrifying now, doesn't it? And you do not talk to your grown-ups when they're like, <laughs> if you've done a naughty one with your pencil, you might want to put a bit of shadow underneath his eyes. If you've done a nice one, you don't really need that. Okay, so back to the teeth. If you want to put nice teeth on, like rounded teeth, you can do, but I'm going to put really nasty teeth on. Now, I know the king of all the dinosaurs, he does have quite a scary kind of um, face, okay? So I'm going to come up here, down here like that, okay? So it's going to look very different to the picture that I did. Can you see? Like that. So he's very, very animated. He's got very scary looking eyes, very scary teeth. We're going to do a simple one. So we're going to draw a big tongue poking out, lick, lick, like a licky dog with all spit coming off it. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna put a little bit of pink on that tongue. And I also give him rosy cheeks, which is really daft because it makes him look quite cute. It's just something I always do, it's my style. So illustrators, we have different sorts of styles. Now, this is tricky. We're gonna come round underneath there. And then this bit, we're gonna come round, there's his little chin, and you're gonna join this line up, okay? Doesn't matter if your T-Rex has got a skinny head, it doesn't matter if it's got a small head and a big body, they're all different and they're all gonna be fantastic. So, with my crayon, I'm gonna come round, and I'm gonna draw a little round fat body like that, he's probably just gobbled up some Stegosaurus. Now, Arms on T-Rexes are really small and pretty pathetic. So what we're going to do, we're going to draw an L for Liz or a V <laughs> for very scary. And then underneath, you're going to do the same thing. So it looks like he's a sergeant, doesn't he? Then we're going to go chicka, chicka, 
with little claws. Again, it doesn't have to look realistic. This is a cartoon. And then this page here, the other hand here, I'm going to do two little lines like that. Okay, dead easy. If you want to put those razor sharp talons on, you can put some claws on like that. Okay, now back legs. If you've ever drawn um, a cheetah, a dog, a horse, back legs go horribly wrong very, very quickly. I know from years of experience. We're going to do a really simple leg. We're going to come down and down. These are not his legs, by the way. If you were a reception thinking, he's got very skinny legs. No, this is one foot. I go ziggy zaggy round like that. Okay. And we want to make it look like he is stomping. So we could do that thing again, couldn't we? Like that. So that is quite tricky. I'm gonna just get a different pen because my pen is running out. So I'm gonna then press down like that. If you want to do a little lumpy bump up here to make it look like he's got a sort of big chicken drumstick leg, you can do. Now, if you've got plenty of space, you can do a big tail. I'm gonna do a big tail, but it's just curling around like that. Okay, I'm not going to put too much colour on, but we are going to put some shadow on. Now, can you see? I've done a round leg there and a square foot there. I'm not worried about that. If it was my first drawing, I'd be fine. I'd redraw it and I'd just cut that leg off and stick another one on. I'd probably round it. This back leg, we're going to put a bit of shading on. Now, when you go to art college and have lessons, you are taught about light and shade. I've just got my crayon on its side. You could do this with your pencil. And you can put a little tummy line on, a bit like when you draw a dragon, with a little thing like that. Now you could do spots, stripes, splodges. I've got a lovely minty green here. And I like doing blue ones, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a green just because I like this colour and I always just see what I feel like doing. You could do a red one, I love purple dinosaurs. So I'm going to get my greeny colour first. Now you don't have to be doing this by the way, you can spend a long time colouring it but this is only a very short video and you can draw this after I've done mine. So I get one colour like that, I've done it really quickly, you can take your time. And then I'm going to get, oh I've got a lovely dark purple here, and I'm going to put some pointy triangles, they look a bit like teeth or little slices of pizza don't they, in and out, ziggy zaggy, and you can spend ages putting splodges or patterns on, and I wouldn't go all the way over his face. If you notice, I've gone around it so we can still see his features like his teeth. And then I'm just gonna put my purple like this. Now, when you are an illustrator, once you've got your character right, you've got to think about the background as well. So I'm just gonna put this color on. Backgrounds sometimes take as long as the characters to get right. I sometimes have to draw for absolute weeks and days getting all my backgrounds in, especially if there's lots of detail. So I've got my shadow under here, action lines, boom, stomp. And if I'm not sure, I get the, the writing and I have a look. So the dinosaur party down by the lake. So we know there's a lake in the background, a rumble in the jungle starting to shake. So. What we're going to do in the background, we're going to do a big, can you see that? I'll move my board. Big hill in the background, but it isn't really a hill. I'm going to put a volcano in, so I've got red crayon spurting out here. You could do a lake, you could do a brontosaurus, you could even read the poem, couldn't you, and come up with your own version of what your dinosaur is doing. Now, us illustrators, we always put our name on. Now you can see I'm cutting a bit of colour on there, like that. And 
I'm going to put my name on. We could also put a raw on, couldn't we? Now, this is definitely one of my favourite things to draw because I find it easy. My brain has drawn that about 500 times, yeah? So if you drew that 500 times, you would find it easy. Now, there's a good chance you've never drawn that before and you've gone wrong and you're crying or you're thinking, why can't I do it? Your brain can't do things straight away, especially if it's tricky and it hasn't done it before. It's like swimming, making a cake. You never get them right first time. It's all about lessons and having practice. But hopefully I've given you a little bit of an idea of what an illustrator has to do. So using that M shape is a good tool, isn't it? Instead of saying, right, draw that. You'd be like, uh, I don't think so. But hopefully this World Book Day, you could maybe come up with your own dinosaur characters, even using uh, the M shape like this. Okay. So there we go, Catherine, really I saw amazing. you drawing away. How well did you do? Because I, I know you said you're arty. I know, really. well, I followed it to the left there. So Let's do have a look. A big reveal, big reveal. Big reveal. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, you've even put colour on. Oh, no, yeah, I got a bit of vinegar. I was like, I'll have to add that later. I'll have to add well, that's it. And later. sometimes I do go a bit fast because I just talk and draw. Yeah, and do you everything always fast. Pause, can't you? That's the beauty <laughs> of these videos. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank we you really, for really appreciate your time and that wonderful drawing. And I hope that our children in our schools will be having fun with that yeah. on World Book Day or we any celebrate other celebrate books, guys. Get out to your libraries, get books out, go to bookshops, just celebrate books. Reading really, really fires your imagination. Try and draw some characters out of your favourite book and come up with some new ideas. Which is your favourite thing to draw? Show someone how to draw like I have just with you, okay? <laughs> thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you thank guys. You happy World Book Week. Yeah, happy World Book Day. Bye-bye.